Hello, John and Nikita. Hey, Bob. Hey, guys. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are, respectively, John Horgan, famous science writer, author of many books, uh, beginning with uh, The End of Science, ending who knows where. I think most recently in some sort of kind of James Joycean kind of exercise of a, of a book. What's it called? Pay attention. Illustrated by my friend Nikita. Okay. And here's Nikita. Excellent segue. We didn't even plan this, folks. Believe it or not, this kind of magic just happens sometimes. <laughs> that leads to Nikita. Nikita Petrov, uh, who I should say uh, does some work for us at the Non-Zero Foundation, which produces the right show and, and uh, blogging head stuff and Meaning of Life TV stuff and the Non-Zero newsletter and so on. Uh, Niki and Nikita has uh, what's the name of your newsletter? Nikita Psychopolitica on Substack. Psychopolitica on Substack or on psychopolitica.com. Politica is spelled with a C. Uh, if I were Nikita and we're Russian, I might have gone with a K, but whatever, it's your branding, it's your branding decision, Nikita. If you were Russian, many things would have been different for you, <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, that's probably true. Um, so we're going to talk about psychedelics and we're going to talk about, well, psychedelics broadly, but I want to pay particular attention to a kind of special category of psychedelics that uh, until recently was way far from the mainstream psychedelic uh, menu, I would say. The kind of ayahuasca DMT family, DMT being an ingredient in ayahuasca. You too have done these things. John, you've done ayahuasca. You wrote about it, I think, in your book, Rational Mysticism. Is that where that? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, Nikita, you've uh, uh, smoked DMT, which is the, the kind of isolated, uh, you know, I guess the main active ingredient in ayahuasca, certainly a, a, a big one. And I, I've done pure DMT and I've done this thing that's called Changa that only appeared, I think, like. 10, 20 years ago, which is sometimes uh, people refer to it as smokable ayahuasca. I'm not totally sure of the logic of it, but it's a mixture of herbs and one contains DMT and then others contain something else. Uh, but it's a, it's a, it's DMT, but it's a different trip. Okay. Is that, so is that Mike, legal? Is that stuff legal? No. no. Oh, okay. Now we'll talk after the show about how you can get a hold of the various <laughs> illegal things you'd like to get a hold of. Okay. Um, the, uh, so yeah, my curiosity was roused when I was listening to a conversation between you two, uh, on Meaning of Life TV about these experiences. I had previously had a conversation with Jay Michelson, uh, who's a writer on both Buddhism, uh, you know, and contemplative experience and somebody who's experienced in psychedelics. And he made a distinction between unitive uh, psychedelics, LSD, mushrooms, and non-unitive, such as, uh, you know, ayahuasca, most forms of DMT. And he, he, he kind of uh, mapped it onto a distinction uh, in, the, in the archives of mystical experience between unitive and non-unitive. The unitive being the classic, you know, to, 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 to parody it, Everything is one, man. I now see it. It's all one. That would be the extreme form. And then the, the non-unit of mystical experience being something I think you find more in the Abrahamic tradition with, with uh, Jewish mystics, Christian mystics, where you have like visions of the other. Of, it might be God. It might be chariots. It might be. But it's more like a visitation uh, from some other being or realm. and. So I just wanted to pursue this uh, since you two guys have kind of been there and I haven't. Now, I was young once. Uh, this may surprise Nikita that I was young once. John, I don't think it will because you've known me since I was pretty young. Uh, so I, I do have some experience with the more conventional psychedelics. Uh, and I, I thought what might be useful is for us to start by talking about what uh, it's hard to generalize about 
any of these things. People's experiences are so particular. But to the extent that it's possible to to generalize, I'd like to start with the mainstream psychedelics, the so-called unitive, uh, for purposes of this conversation, I guess, and um, and, and and talk a little about general, you know, general expectations you might have of those, and uh, and then move on to the the ayahuasca DMT stuff. Um, you know, I I, I think uh, unitive is a good word for a lot of uh, experiences with kind of mainstream psychedelics. Uh, an example I brought up in my conversation with Jay Michelson was Steve Jobs' famous experience where uh, he's on LSD and he sees that, wow, you've got technology and the liberal arts, and they actually are one. They can be one. And it's his mission to make it clear to people that there is a natural merger of them or something. That's a kind of unit of experience. Uh, and I, I'm kind of familiar with I, I'm I'm kind of familiar with that from my youth, you know, having previously seen two things as more in separate categories, uh, and seeing them as uh, more uh, more connected. So that that's one thing. For, so for starters, what would you guys say about that? The, the whole the unitive. In what sense is in your in your experience can like mushrooms and LSD be unitive? Oh, uh, they can definitely be unitive. You can have that feeling of oneness and it's not abstract and intellectual. It's, it's visceral. You, you feel yourself, you look at things and, uh, you look at other people and you feel this, um, this profound connection with them, but the classic psychedelics, LSD and, and, um, um, mescaline and psilocybin and things like that can also push you in the other direction where you feel completely alienated from everything around you and where everything gets metaphysically really, really complicated. And by the way, people who've looked at, who've tried to understand and categorize mystical experiences have also drawn attention to the variety of, of, um, of the experiences. So uh, William James, for example, in Varieties of a Religious Experience, talked about the classic unitive experience, which is really blissful, and you feel a sense of timelessness, and um, all the universe seems to be one unified consciousness or, or spirit. I think and he mentions an oceanic feeling. The word oceanic appears in that context in his book, I think. The oceanic is actually a word that uh, Freud used to describe these experiences in the course of disparaging them as a regression to our feelings of being in the womb. But James pointed out that, that religious experiences come in all different forms. He talked about something called the, uh, the diabolical experience, where you feel disconnected from all of you uh yeah. from reality and um you have an experience of there being no god at all no meaning no purpose to existence or that the purpose is dark and demonic somehow so it's you know that would count as a as a bad trip i've had that sort of experience as well as the uh unitive one and then they're just trips that are busy that have that that throw all these images at you um, in the same way that uh, that dreams do, and sometimes are populated with um, with other creatures, yeah. and and that and you don't necessarily feel any commonality with them. So, um, and as I said, I I think uh, this variety comes from all the psychedelics. At least that's been my experience. But maybe the DMT, I'd say, um, lends itself more to the, the really metaphysically complicated non-unitive right. experience. So Nikita, what, do you, what, what is your feeling about the unitive aspect of kind of conventional psychedelics? Does that ring true to you? I say with John in that it can be that, it can be the other thing. In my experience, there's always, uh, if everything goes right, there's always the unitive aspect to it. 
when I do feel isolated, it tends to be because I'm in a bad environment. Uh, it's uh, There are a lot of people around that set I don't and, want set to Set and be. setting, man. Did I forget to tell you that? Set and setting. <laughs> you got to experiment, man. Um, but, uh, but I'm... First of all, I'm very skeptical of all maps there. Like if I am advising somebody who's never done psychedelics, yeah, I give them like the safety kind of precautions. Like if things go wrong, do this. Um, but I try not to impose any kind of a framework on them because it's like the, to me, it's the core uh aspect and value of these experiences that they're your own you're this is happening to you and it's for you to figure out how you are going to integrate it into your life and how you're going to put some words on it for yourself um i i should say with dmt all of my experiences with dmt definitely have had the unitive aspect to them yeah i've i've definitely felt that everything is connected and just like everything, me and yeah. uh, the rest of the world, my psyche and my body and Putin sitting in his place, whatever, like everything is this web of interconnections. But the DMT does have this quality that a lot of people report of an alien, alienness yeah. in it. And it's very paradoxical that there's like, um, there's a unity of oppositions there. It's very alien but it is also very familiar. It's, uh, there's a lot of things happening, but uh, they are one big process. Okay, let me uh, say a couple of things before we move toward uh, kind of, because I know you, Nikita, especially have had a, a number of those kinds of, uh, you might say visitation experiences with DMT mm-hmm. that you've tried to pay close attention to. And I, I definitely want to get to those. Uh, on, on, uh, on the... First of all, I agree, Nikita, I I do not casually, you know, there are people who say, wow, if everybody would drop acid, it would be such a wonderful world. I do not casually recommend that people Mm -hmm. go around, you know, it's like it is intense. And especially if you take a lot, it's unpredictable. Bad things can happen. uh, And when they when they're bad, they're really bad for a while. Uh, uh, you know, and uh, so, yeah, I, I advise care and research and uh so on um i want to say one quick thing about the unitive aspect uh and traditional mysticism you know in buddhism there's this concept of emptiness in especially mahayana buddhism and the idea is that uh things are are empty of uh essence that 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 without really thinking about it when we see the world we are attributing essence to the people and things and and uh, that we're looking at and a truer experience would be one that didn't attribute that. And I've, I've gotten a little of that picture, like especially on meditation retreats, what they mean. But more importantly, I've talked to very accomplished meditators who say that that's become part of their way of seeing the world. And they describe a world, uh, well, there's two, two things to say. One is they describe a world where things have, you might say, less sharp edges. There, there's more. It just seems more like this lamp and this wall are a little less separate. They can tell the difference between the two, but it's a more unified perception of the world. And and they say it's better. It's it's you know they're they're they're, they're uh, it's it's a it's a calmer, better way of being. But but there's also a whole philosophy connected to this that talks about what you mentioned, uh, Nikita, which is the interconnection of things, the causal mm-hmm. interconnection of things. Uh, everything influences everything and so, and so on. So that's, mm-hmm. that's a little side note. Uh, then I, w- I wanted to pick up on the, on the alienation you can get from traditional psychedelics by way of suggesting a second property that I think uh, traditional psychedelics can have, which is, which is this, you know, when we go through life, Without realizing it, we have all kinds of assumptions at the cognitive and perceptual level that just help us be human beings and navigate the human world. Like if I shake hands with somebody and say, hi, I don't think, oh, so human beings have this handshaking ritual. Like, what the hell is this? You know, I don't normally think that. Uh, And but uh, in my experience on traditional psychedelics, the whole thing 
is a little more like you're an anthropologist from another planet. And there's a lot of things you're no longer taking for granted about the human experience, including things you naturally do. And that can be alienated, alienating. And it can even happen at the sheerly perceptual level. Like I remember once I had taken LSD and I was playing catch with a baseball. And, you know, we take for granted how amazing it is that you can like be running and catch a moving ball. And yet the field seems kind of constant to you. Now, if you're in a movie theater and, and, and they've had a camera do this and the camera that took the film d did the exact same thing, like they attach a camera to a guy's head and he's backing up and catching this baseball. It's very jarring and disorienting. The camera's moving all over the place. We take for granted the fact that we correct for all this. And I remember I was playing catch and I'm going, whoa, like all this shit. It's like there's this camera in my head. It's going up and down and, and, and so on. So, so, so that's a case where we have perceptual assumptions, you know, that we, we just take for granted. And then there's also all these kinds of assumptions about the social world that we take for granted. And in my experience, uh, psychedelics can just give you, in that sense, a more detached perspective. And beyond a point, that can be alienating. It can be like, whoa, what the hell? You know, does that, does that make sense? Yeah. And it can also be just too much. Like there are so many things we don't notice uh, in normal life that when you do notice them, it's just so much data to parse. Like uh -huh. you're talking to somebody and they have the facial expressions and they eye, eyes for a second go into a different direction. And if you were to pay close attention to all of that and uh, try to interpret every single thing, and given the, how many interpretations can there be for somebody looking the other way for a second, it can be just way too much to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I've got some, I've got some thoughts about uh, about that experience that you're describing, uh, Bob. It seems to me that I mean the, the the essential psychedelic experience to me is a sense of um, the strangeness of things, and it applies to everything. So you're starting right. to get high, and I remember, yeah. You know, like the first time I took a really big dose of uh, LSD, I think I was maybe 16 years old. I was at my parents' house and they were oh, going. That's a good night. idea. Were your parents there? No, my parents were gone for the night. Okay, good. But my siblings were upstairs watching TV and I'm getting high. I'm, I'm looking out on the lawn of our uh, backyard. And I just got a sense that um, everything was really, really strange. Uh, and that this whole scene, existence itself, was completely improbable. And I'm the most improbable thing of all, that I can even be here witnessing this. I'm hearing my, my siblings upstairs watching TV, some stupid sitcom, and I, and I actually had the impulse to run up and, and grab them and shake them and say, do you realize how incredible it is that we even exist? And to me, I've never lost that. And it's, it keeps coming back in, um, in other trips. And I can, it, it even comes back sometimes when I'm, when I'm meditating, it happened when I was on this silent retreat. And it seems to me that it's, uh, it's, it's a reaction to our normal habituation. I think our brains are designed. Mm -hmm. You were mm -hmm. referring to this, Bob, our brains are designed to get shit done. Right. So that we can be functioning human beings. Natural selection designed us that way. It did not design us to pay attention to the incredible complexity of all these tasks that we routinely perform, or even something like we're doing right now, talking about these complicated ideas. Psychedelics, for some reason, break through that habituation, and you're sort of looking at yourself, and you're looking at the world and seeing just how improbable and weird it is. Then the question is what you do with that. That can be, that can you lead you to feel alienated and estranged for everything. That's certainly a very common experience in my own trips, but it can also make you, it makes me feel really happy to be alive. You yeah. sort of realize that 
there's no reason for us to be here at all. It is infinitely improbable that we exist and that we have the capacity to look at the world and have all these emotions and to share the emotions with other creatures who are wandering through this, this world. Um, and that, that experience, that anti-habituation insight makes me really happy. That's as good a feeling as I can have. So it can go in either either yeah. direction. Now the, now, the sense of improbability you, you, you kind of dwell on there, that's not something I've uh, ever kind of felt in particular on, on psychedelics. And I, and I think, you know, now people's own philosophical obsessions shape their experience. However, sure. the, um, the, the, the other thing, the kind of the sense of wonder I think is a fairly generic feature under the right circumstances of, uh, of, of psychedelics, like uh, just staring at a blade of grass with an insect on it and going, this in itself is completely amazing. This is a very complicated creature. And, and uh, you know, and it's kind of connected to a sense of perceptual clarity that kind of crystallizes the amazingness of it. You know, there's a kind of a, a vividness. Um, but I think, I, I do think the sense of wonder that is part of your description is, is something a whole lot of uh, people who have done kind of, you know, mainstream psychedelics could relate to. But it's, it's, it's not a wonder that is, and the, mon- the wonder can manifest itself in lots of ways. So for example, yeah, seeing a ladybug crawling up a blade of grass, you go, oh my God, that's such an amazing little mechanism and you can contemplate your own body and realize what a fantastically intricate piece of engineering it is. But at the bottom of the wonder for me is a sense of the miraculousness that anything exists at all. So that's kind of the, the core of it. Nikita, have you, what have you had that particular experience? I mean, there's, there's amazingness generically, wonder generically, being amazed about reality. And then there's John's more specific focus on the improbability of it all. I'm just curious about your... I don't think I focus on the improbability a whole lot. To me, the uh, key flavor to the wonder is a realization of how little of a handle I have on everything that's happening. Like in normal life, I feel like I basically understand what's going on. And then uh, you smoke some DMT and that's out of the window in the first 10 seconds. I have no clue uh, what I am. What is my relationship to the world? Is there an I or is that an illusion? Uh, All the different processes that are normally hidden uh, in a DMT flesh become this vivid hallucination uh, if you pay attention, in my experience, when you pay attention, you realize that there's all of this stuff happening in my subconsciousness. Uh, there's There are all of these hidden connections between me, the animal, the, this particular mm-hmm. organism, and the rest of the world. Within that organism, there's uh, so many different things happening. I, I mean, I don't particularly think about like the microbiome in my gut, but uh, that is, that's one of the ways to explain some of the things that are happening in the DMT flesh. You just become aware of all of the different moving pieces within this experience. But how much of that is uh, peculiar DMT and how much of it is what you would experience on mushrooms or LSD or something? Again, I think it's very, it's a person dependent, it's day dependent. It's a, a, it's the same person on a different day in a different situation would have a different experience. Mushrooms, in my experience, can be a million different things. It can get very DMT-like, uh, or it can be a, a something completely different. LSD, in again, in my experience, and I haven't had it in a while, uh, is more cognitive, is more like I don't get visuals. On, on or or mm-hmm. very slight visuals on on LSD, and it's more you kind of become more aware of the cognitive patterns that you are embedded in that uh, carry on on their own, and you're caught in various loops and the interconnections between 
thought and film and whatnot. But on LSD, it's it's still it, it's more in my head. Uh, and with DMT, there's lately the way I've been thinking about it is is just a whole lot of stuff that is normally um, that I'm normally not aware of becomes this incredibly rich visual experience. And if you pay attention to different areas of this multidimensional landscape of experience that you're uh, witnessing, you can start to notice that there's this whole area of moving things and it actually is connected to a particular area in your body, let's say, or a particular train of thought or an attitude or something. And it's just happening all at once and you can just move your attention from one area to another. And it took me a while uh, and, and, and several trips to start noticing these connections between, let's say, the body and the experience. The first six times I've done DMT, I was not aware I had a body. Uh, it was the, the, the flow of this experience was so much that uh, just remembering that I'm a person in a body on the bed somewhere um, was too difficult. And then, okay, not the first six, the first four. And then on the fifth one, I, in the middle of the trip, I noticed that there's still a body and it's doing things and I was muttering things and I was moving around and the sounds I was making and the movements I was making uh, correlated with the uh, contents of the trip. So it's, it's, it's disassociative, is that the term? I mean, there's, a, there's less association with your body. The body tends to be somewhat immobilized. It's basically, you basically just lie there. Depends on how you do it. This is kind of the the advised advised way to do it. It's not so much in again in my experience. I always have to make this caveat because it's so very different for different people. But uh, in my experience, it's not that it's dissociative. It's just there's too many things happening to pay attention to all of them. And so the first four times I do it, did it, I just didn't have the capacity to remember mm -hmm. that there is also this. Uh, physical world that I can feel uh, in a more conventional okay. way. I want to I, I want to ask you both now about a particular dimension of the uh, kind of non-unitive uh, dimension of the ayahuasca DMT experience. Um, first, I want to say one more thing about the unitive aspect of psychedelics. You know, there's there's been a lot of work uh, giving um, you know mushrooms or LSD to people who have terminal illnesses and. And, you know, in a very carefully controlled setting, maybe listening to music and so on, maybe having certain people there, whatever, a lot of uh, these people do seem to find it consoling. And I, I think there's a unitive aspect to that, which is that part of the experience is the sense that, oh, my life has coherence. It, maybe it has seemed like I moved here and took this job and I got, and this happened and this happened and this happened, but it really has all added up to something. It really has led somewhere. And this is, a, a, it hasn't been for nothing. There's a, I, 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 there's a you know, I, I think you, you get that kind of report. So that's a, that's a very different kind of um, unitive thing. But, but on the, um, the non-unitive, so one, one thing I'm really interested in is this idea that you get visited by beings, right? Now, if I'm recalling correctly, uh, John, there was at least a little of that in the ayahuasca experience you described in in rational mysticism. There was a vision of something or other. I, I certainly remember the part where you were throwing up. <laughs> and, and by the way, I, this is ayahuasca uh, often induces that. Uh, DMT per se doesn't. It's a little like the peyote mescaline distinction, I guess. Peyote uh, is a less refined version and does make people throw up sometimes, uh, mescaline, not so much, but, um, were you about to say something, John? Well, I, I, I could just tell you a little bit about what happened in that trip. This is 1999. I was doing research for my book, rational mysticism. And, um, that's, that's I joined a, a group excuse. on, uh, yeah, it was tax. Oh, I'm doing research. It was tax deductible. In fact, um, I was with two anthropologists who specialize in um, psychedelic plants and had a lot of experience with uh, ayahuasca and a bunch of other um, affluent white folks. And we were on in this uh, 
really beautiful spot on the edge of the Pacific. We all took this stuff. And at the peak of the experience for me, I felt I was totally overwhelmed by these visual hallucinations and that they, they were like um, these kind of animated shards of colored glass that were dancing around and had a vaguely malevolent presence. <laughs> so it was really weird. I'd never seen anything like this on um, LSD or, or, uh, or mushrooms. And um, it was a little creepy, but the journalist in me was sort of standing back and looking at it and just thinking, oh, this is really interesting. This seems like what Terrence McKenna, who was really into um, DMT, he's this kind, was this kind of uh, philosophical um, psychedelic adventurer. Uh, I didn't like it overall. I, the experience was really fascinating to me uh, as a kind of social phenomenon. The fact that all these people are taking this stuff that made them sick, some of them were crying and moaning and, and distressed throughout the night. Um, you know, so what the hell are they after? For me, the DMT experience was really cold, really cold and alienating um, in a way that um, I hadn't really encountered before, not with, uh, not with LSD and psilocybin and, uh, and mescaline. So it seems to, for me, the drug had a very different character than anything else I've experienced. It's kind of an outlier. I couldn't really you know, make sense of it. People who haven't done psychedelics may be surprised that you were surprised because they hear that hallucination is such a big part of LSD experience. But it, I don't really think it it is for many people. I never flat out hallucinated on LSD, even though there were times when I certainly took enough to, in principle, induce that. I think with me, it was like, I didn't want to let go enough to hallucinate. I remember one point where I felt I could have, I could even see the way hallucination was taking shape. It was like, um, the, you know, uh, when you see the world out there, you, in order to see it in three dimensions, you're actually imposing certain assumptions on it. That's why optical illusions work. They get you to impose the wrong assumptions on a two-dimensional array of data. And what I saw happening was as the I, I relaxed the assumptions and the third dimension kind of collapsed. And I thought, oh, it's a two-dimensional array of, of uh, pixels. You can turn that into anything you want. You can reconstruct it by imposing new assumptions on it. And then, and then part of me thought, uh, no, I don't think I want to go there. <laughs> I'm not sure good things would happen. And, uh, but, it, but in any event, I think you can talk to a lot of people who say hallucination in the extreme sense was not part of the classic, uh, psychedelic experience. And it seems to me, it, it, it sounds like it is more likely to happen by a long shot with ayahuasca DMT. So, so John, final question for you about this experience though. These beings seem to be kind of alive because I think when we hear from Nikita, we're going to hear definitely they seemed to be alive. But um, they, they there was that. I mean, did they try to communicate with you or tell you or anything, or just kind of they wanted to scare you and and mess with your head? They they were more. They, actually, I, I guess I used the word malevolent. It was more that they were mischievous and playful, but not necessarily warm hearted. And so they were sort of, uh, I felt like they were putting they, me they, in my They sound like, they sound a little like you, actually. <laughs> yeah, it was like they were putting me in my place. Like, you think you know what's going on? Yeah, let, let's take a look at this. And then they give me some amazing display. And I, I have to say that, you know, going back to Nikita's point about the enormous uh, variety of responses to these drugs, I took ayahuasca again a few years ago in a basement in a house in suburban Long Island and up with about, I don't know, maybe 40 people. It was really mixed, interesting mixed crowd of white people and African-Americans. And again, you know, people are moaning and crying and throwing up. I had again, these kind of Sounds great. dancing shards of glass. And um, meanwhile, there's a person right next to me who happened to be, happens to be one of my colleagues here at my school. And he was alternately laughing hysterically and sobbing 
for the whole night. It was actually annoying. So the, the leader of the group <laughs> <laughs> told him to calm down at one point. And the next day I said, what the hell was going on with you? And he said he had been plunged into his childhood and was having all these reliving all these experiences that were either really good or really bad. So for him, it was like this profoundly emotional, psychological journey into his deep past. I've never had anything like that mm -hmm. on uh, certainly not on ayahuasca, uh, which again, I said was very kind of cold and clinical um, and not on any other psychedelics either. So, so uh, Nikita, now I gather, um, so you've what you've, you've uh, smoked DMT, what uh, I guess I gather six, eight, 10 times or something over the last, over the last few years. Uh, I mean, it's not, it's not something one does like every Friday night. The, uh, no. um, now I, and I recall you reporting, uh, kind of much more fleshed out beings, uh, visiting you, communicating with you. Is that right? Do you want to talk about, uh, what that's like? Yeah. So again, there's a variety of experiences. Uh, the earliest trips were more, the, the, these entities were more pronounced. I could like, I would focus on the entity and there is this process of communication with them. And, uh, I was trying to figure out what it is that they're trying to show me or explain to me or demand from me. Um, the later experiences with that thing, Changa, so that's a mixture of herbs. One of them contains DMT. It is a definitely a DMT experience, but there is a slightly different feel to it. Um, uh, the they led me to my latest theory on these entities that has to do with uh, what you said about um, the assumptions that are constantly running uh, in our life uh, for us to make sense of of this world. Like uh, you know, I'm looking at the objects. On my table, I see objects on my table. I am not experiencing what is really going on, which is what a flow of photons hitting my retina. And then this gets interpreted by some part of my psyche that I don't have ready access to. You, and then it's presented to me in this, like this is a table and this is a cup and so forth. And so um, my latest theory is, so in the DMT experience, in my um, uh, history with it, everything seems to be imbued with a presence. Anywhere you look, there is uh, something that can be seen as a different entity showing you things. Okay, but wait, I mean, uh, in regular experience, everything is imbued with a presence, right? I mean, well, I look around, everything seems to be, everything I see seems to be here. It, it presence, I mean, like, uh, another being being there there's a mind uh, in it there's a mind, oh, I, mind yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, so everything you see seems conscious so well let me let me try to, okay. to explain my theory uh, i think one way to describe what is happening uh one way to try to put a handle on it is you see those parts of your psyche that are not ordinarily available to you that are presenting the world to you, right? So again, when I look at a cup, uh, I'm seeing a cup, but it's by the time that I'm uh, aware of the cup, there's this work that has been done by my subconsciousness uh, to put it together into various categories. It's a physical object. It's this far away from you. It has this shape. And actually, when I look at a cup, I'm not even aware of those things. I immediately think this is a cup. But it is my psyche presenting this thing to me. Here's a cup. Uh, instead of here's an incredible flow of, uh, well, you see, know, the, the primary that's a, datum. That's a little like the Buddhist experience of emptiness. In other words, cupness is something you're imposing on the cup in the, in this right. view of the world. It, uh, a cup does, there's no essence of cup in a cup. Somebody from another planet wouldn't look at that and go, oh, that's a cup. Right. Um, so go ahead. 
Is and that so, that's so where it, it sounds related to this? Yeah, and so and I'm mostly thinking about mostly talking about not objects in the real world because it's hard uh, on DNT to keep your eyes open and try to make sense of all of this. Uh, there's mm -hmm. enough shit happening just behind your closed eyelids. Uh, but regardless, whether your eyes are open or not, um, anywhere you look, so let's say my eyes are closed and I'm seeing this incredible multidimensional landscape of things happening, any region of that landscape, uh, I can sort of switch, if I try, switch my lenses and pay attention to the thing that's being presented to me. Here are thought patterns uh, tied with emotional patterns, tied with things happening in the body, so forth. Or I can change my perspective and focus on the medium that carries that message for me. And that medium is this entity. This, is, this landscape is alive and has a personality to it. And I can uh, look at, at it one way. This is an entity presenting things to me. Or I can look at the things that are being presented or I can start noticing that the thing being presented and the entity presenting the thing to me seem to be one and the same. So, and they it, like flow from uh, it, one it, it, uh, way to another. Is it like even when you're not seeing actual beings, like these visual beings that are very active, uh, mm -hmm. the universe generally seems more active? The, the, the world out there, the material world seems like more active and like uh, almost as if your perception of it involves a kind of effort on its part or results from its activity or what? I don't know about effort, but it's definitely very active. Everything is very, very much alive and okay. there's a million things happening at the so, same So there's a spectrum. Second. I mean, this is interesting because I, I think of like what John reported is kind of halfway between that, just seeing like the walls is in some sense playing a more active role in my perception of them. At one end of the spectrum, there's that. At another end, there's like actual fleshed out beings saying stuff to you. And then it sounds like John's experience was almost kind of in the middle. It's like fragments of glass, but they're kind of alive. They're not really talking a lot, but they have intentionality. I'm trying to decipher it and so on. Is that, does this make sense? Uh, can I, uh, yeah, let me, let me, um, I mean, to me, it's, it's, fun to speculate on the metaphysical implications of these sorts of experiences. So what Nikita is describing and, and uh, what I experience with these dancing shards of glass, one of the ways I interpreted it while I was having it, you know, after I sort of got out of the overwhelmingness of the experience itself was that I was seeing the, the machinery of my own brain I, mm -hmm. I, I was seeing computations happening and um, and it was it was animated by some kind of intelligence. And but I was experiencing my own brain as this kind of alien object inside me. Um, that was part of what made it really weird and creepy, but also sort of wonderful. I, I just happened to be working on a column for Scientific American right now about. Um, whether or not there's something called quantum psychiatry. In other words, whether quantum mechanics uh, can offer any possible help in trying to understand how our minds work and why we become psychotic and why our minds don't work very often. And um, this, is, this is kind of like the fringe of the fringe, but there's some interesting ideas. Uh, I just read a paper that says, that takes the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics very seriously. At, you know, which says basically that all of the possibilities uh, for a particle moving through space that are described by the Schrodinger equation actually happen, but in different universes. You know, we only experience one trajectory here, but all the other possibilities are happening out there. And this guy says that are these universes are totally disconnected. They interfere with each other in various ways, and that can explain. Um, psychosis and the thought intrusions that happen with uh, with uh, people with schizophrenia, and even the the random ideas and emotions that pop up into our the he, the uh, the minds okay. of 
of normal, healthy people. So far, I'm skeptical, but go ahead. <laughs> well, so um, what I like about this is that it just, you know, so that th there's there's a, a very, uh, there's a common interpretation of mystical experiences, all these sorts of wild things that we're talking about that are induced by psychedelics or happen spontaneously, whatever. It's called the perennial philosophy. Bob, right. you've talked about it a lot. It's trying to come up with a, a general sort of spiritual metaphysics based on all these experiences and it postulates the existence of some kind of godlike force that pervades everything. And, um, and if we're fortunate, we can have experiences and we realize we're part of this, uh, this eternal force. There is no death. There are only transformations, yada, yada. It's very nice and reassuring. But these other experiences complicate that. They shatter that picture to my mind. They make it very difficult to uh, sustain. My experiences and, and the experiences that Nikita is describing and that a lot of other people have, to me, make the perennial philosophy just a kind of wishful thinking. A way well, it's funny because, uh, I mean, more. a lot of people taking mainstream psychedelics, I think, would say the, the opposite. Aldous Huxley, who popularized the phrase perennial philosophy, also wrote a book called The Doors of Perception about psychedelics. Uh, I think a lot of people would say the opposite of what you're saying, right? I mean, they'd say, they'd say yeah, uh, now I get it. It's all, you know, there's a unity here, as the mystics have said, and as a certain interpretation of Abrahamic theology might say. And so, I mean, you do, you do get the, the exact opposite of what you're reporting, right? Uh, now, these aren't people, by and large, who have done ayahuasca and DMT, so far as I know. And, and one thing I'm interested in is the, you know, the difference in properties. But does that make sense? Well, I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I think we're agreeing with each other. I'm saying that the... Um that lots of people come away from psychedelic experiences with the perennial philosophy confirmed. They come up with this kind of nice feel good metaphysics in which, you know, we all come out of the great spirit and we're all going to go back to the great spirit. And yes, there's suffering and shit happens and some bad things in this world, but ultimately everything is going to be fine. Um, the DMT experiences and a lot of the other the experiences that you get from other psychedelics complicate things. This yeah. is what I was saying in the beginning, that there are these diabolical experiences that um, it'd be nice to just say, no, those are those are true. Those are delusional. But all the, the happy, blissful experiences, right. those are true. OK, that's it's too easy to say that. Then there are all the complicated visionary experiences of other worlds other, you know, demons and angels and all that kind of yeah. stuff. And again, I guess I'm at this point in my life, I'm inclined to be open-minded. And that's why I'm even entertaining these crazy theories about many worlds and the interference of them. And that's what is giving us some of uh, our unusual experiences in, in this world. And maybe these DMT aliens are actually from some of these other parallel. Well, uh, let me, let me say, I mean, first, I don't go into this assuming that psychedelics are showing us the truth in any case. To me, my default way of approaching this is, well, you put chemicals in your brain. This happens. This may say something interesting about kind of the knobs and tunings that are available in your brain. For example, one thing William James uh, writes about in varieties of religious experience is nitrous oxide, which is, you know, kind of a uh, a recreational drug, uh, sometimes used by college students, if I'm recalling correctly. And and one thing he he reports, which I think is is if I'm again if I'm recalling correctly, which I think is exactly right, is like uh, nitrous oxide gives you this sense of truth. Oh, this is really true, and and, and that sense of truth is so can be so detached. It is so independent of the belief it's being applied to that with nitrous oxide, as the experience fades, you can go, no, wait, what was true? Like, I thought I had the secret to the universe. Now I can't even remember what it is, what it was. All I remember is the sense of truth. So this suggests that there is like a tune, there's, there's like your brain can attach uh, credibility to, to anything. It can attach the belief in truth 
to anything, to this proposition, to that proposition. And that's very consistent with the current understanding of the human mind as the thing that's not a reliable guide to the truth. People believe things that, that, you know, they're more attentive to, you know, confirmation bias. They're more attentive to evidence that supports their views and so on. So, so uh, this is a tangent uh, just designed to drive home that my assumption is not that, oh, all of the stuff we're seeing on drugs is true, and now we have to figure out what's the common denominator. But I would say this, that uh, it, it could be truer than regular experience, because Again, part of the contemporary view of the world, of, of the human mind, is this is not a reliable guide to reality. The human mind was designed to get genes into the next generation. It's not going to be uh, good at apprehending objective truth necessarily, although in some respects you, you actually would expect it to be if it's designed to get genes into the next generation. And, uh, and that's why I'm interested, for example, when I, when I say, well, psychedelics can get you to relax some of the assumptions that uh, being a human brain, you know, t t t that a human brain carries around, maybe sometimes it is getting you closer to something you can think of as the objective truth. It could be, could be, but that would almost be like a happy accident. And, and I want to think about that possibility, but I'm certainly not I don't go into the analysis of psychedelic experiences with what I would consider a naive belief that they're always bringing you closer to reality. Well, there is like turning those knobs on the dashboard of experience can help you triangulate what the truth, quote unquote, is. Like if, if all that you've ever experienced was reality as presented by your dashboard, um, and you forget that that's a dashboard, you think that's reality, then once you start playing with that dashboard and realizing, oh, if I turn this knob, everything seems to be imbued with meaning. And if I turn it down, everything seems to be meaningless, meaningless then you're more aware of the range of possibilities. And it, it, you, you start to be aware of that dashboard being there and uh, the experience that you normally have, ordinarily have, not being the reality. And then from there, you can try to patch it together and realize, okay, so I saw it from this angle, it looked like this. From this angle, it looked like that. Maybe it's a you know three-dimensional object that looks differently from different sides. Yeah, yeah. I, I, let me try, let me respond to what you just said too, Bob. I mean, what you just said about psychedelics, I would I would say is true of any experience, experiences right. that come through meditation or just the experiences that I have here at my school or while I'm walking around or I'm in a classroom. It seems to me that that the job of well, the way I look at at any of these experiences is as raw material and um, I'm trying to make sense of them. And, you know, I read a lot. I talk to people to guys like you who are also trying to make sense of, you know, the insanity of life. And, um, and I try to come away with something. There's a lot that can be dismissed. Um, psychedelics are often just very noisy. You know, they generate a lot of bullshit and there are all these delusions. There are things that I can immediately uh, dismiss. So the question is, what can I take away? And can I construct any kind of worldview of metaphysics out of these experiences and i there's not much that i take away i i enjoy the experiences for their own sake they're like little adventures and um i enjoy the variety of things that can happen uh both just as a sentient human being and as somebody who's taking these drugs or meditating taking retreats whatever but the only takeaway the only thing that really um I definitely believe in is what I was saying earlier that life is infinitely improbable. And that to me is, I, I feel it viscerally on psychedelics and I felt it while, while meditating. And it just is a feeling that overcomes me spontaneously for one reason or another. And that to me absolutely uh, meshes with my understanding of modern science, which I think is increasingly uh, leading to the conclusion that the existence of the universe 
of life on earth and of consciousness, you know, the, the fact that some creatures, some kinds of life on earth have the ability to reflect on their existence, that all of that, it seems to me, is uh, infinitely improbable according to science. Well, I'm, I'm not aware of science having anything to say at all about the probability of the universe existing, but that's another argument. Uh, the, the, um, the, the, uh, 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 I guess I would say, I, I, I agree. I mean, so we both go into this not assuming that this is truth. On the other hand, and here I'm thinking more of meditation, um, I, I do uh, uh, think, and I would say this is truer of a serious meditation practice than at least the psychedelics as I, as, as I recall, um, that uh, there can be a kind of a systematic uh, appraisal of what the experience, how the experience may be bringing you uh, closer to what you could call maybe a more objective truth or something. Uh, what I mean is that, you know, in the course of a, of a sustained, like, two-week silent meditation uh, retreat in, say, the Vipassana kind of slash mindfulness tradition, I do think it's possible to become more aware of aspects of your everyday experience that you can attribute to the way the human mind was kind of engineered by natural selection. I mean, I mean, at a, at a, for example, just the way feelings are influencing your thoughts, you become more aware of that. And, and, and certain, certain ways, paths of influence start to make sense to me, at least in terms of, uh, of evolution, like, uh, oh, I see it. Yeah, it makes sense that I react to particular people like this. My feelings about them shape this thought. And I really shouldn't assume that's a reliable thought because uh, I can see why evolution would bias you to separate people into different categories, react to some this way and that way. And, and to the extent that that shapes your perception and, and, and your thought about them, that that's probably not like the objective truth I'm naturally getting. And I do think I can have uh, developed some confidence that uh, a more mindful state is in that sense, sometimes a more, uh, you know, kind of reliable uh, 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 state, at least in the sense of being less warped by the particular evolutionary history of the species whose brain I'm carrying around. Now, I mean, obviously, I wrote a book called Why Buddhism is True. Obviously, I have this kind of, uh, I've developed, uh, you know, I, I've developed this argument about why, um, you know, certain aspects of the practice can bring you closer. But, but I think this maybe, John, separates us a little, it sounds like. On the one hand, we both are going into this not assuming that any given experience you have is, 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 is by virtue of being an, an experience, a, 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 a reliable one. On the other hand, I do think you can subject uh, meditation and to some extent psychedelics to analysis in, in hopes of trying to, to pick out places where, yeah, maybe this is, maybe this is a truer view than this, the default human view. I, you know, for me, I guess we both go into these with our own biases. I'm a kind of extreme skeptic. I I love ideas, but then I love to dismantle them and to find fault with them. Um, and this is kind of this is uh, something that uh, pretty much describes my work as a uh, as a science writer. In the case of meditation and uh, and psychedelics, they give me they give me ideas which I entertain. As you know, I have a kind of bizarre theology that was inspired by a psychedelic trip in which I think that everything was created by this, by this, uh, God that's having an existential identity. We are, we are God chewing his fingernails in this view. Yes. That was the wonderful phrase that you came up with when I was first trying to describe this theory to you about 30 years ago. But the older I get, the more I think about all these things, the more I, I, I look at science, philosophy, theology, uh, think about my own um, 
experiences meditating or and taking psychedelics, the more convinced I am that all our knowledge is pathetically inadequate and it always will be. And our efforts to know ourselves um, are completely futile. So um, all this reinforces the sense that I, I've been describing that, I mean, it's banal really, but life is fucking weird. <laughs> and, um, and we're the weirdest things about it. Uh, and that for a lot of people, that would be kind of a dissatisfying conclusion to their intellectual journey and, or as a, an answer to, um, the meaning of life. Uh, but it works for me. Um, I'm, you know, I, I feel as though I'm seeing things most clearly when I'm most overwhelmed by confusion and bafflement at everything, um, rather than a, a sense that I know what's going on, which I feel like is what you're describing, Bob. I envy you that, that meditation has taken you in, um, in that direction where you feel like you know yourself and, and you know how your interactions with the world and with other people work. Um, I have that as a kind of working hypothesis to help me get through the day. I'm, you know, I, I've, I've got a job, I've got a girlfriend, I've got kids. I can't be just totally agog at the world. Um, but that the part of me that really thinks about what's happening in the world is agog all the time and is totally confused and becoming more confused the more I think about these issues. Yeah, I, I want to add something to the question of what do you get away from these experiences? And I'm thinking of my latest DMT trip where I came, went into it with like a bunch of ideas I was working on at the time, sort of developing my worldview. I had some premises for what I might think reality is. And they felt like, you know, I have something here. I can work on this further and uh, develop a worldview that is actually you know, approaching uh, an, a, a correct description of what is going on. And then very quickly into that experience, like, okay, you need to throw all of that away because it clearly has nothing to do with what is going on because what is going on is completely beyond your ability to comprehend. Then after the trip ended, I thought, that doesn't mean you need to throw those things away. You, you, you throw away things that are not useful. Uh, an idea that is not correct, but you can work with and get some results that helps you, that's still a worthwhile idea. And so there, and it happens to me every time I, I do a, a large dose of psychedelics, I feel liberated by getting rid of ideas that seemed like a description of reality. Like there's a, there's a load that is taken away from my shoulders uh, because now I can relax knowing that I have no idea what is going on. And so it's, it, you know, it's okay. You don't have to be correct because you're probably not going to be. And then at the same time, the, it's, it surprises me about DMT experiences in particular. Uh, even I've had some experience on very small doses with that Changa thing. Uh, somehow... On an unconscious level, often, they just make me more productive and uh, somehow like focus me and, and make me do things that I should be doing. And so that, that particular experience I'm thinking about, on the one hand, like on this metaphysical level, like of my, me trying to construct a metaphysical worldview, it just took everything away from me and put me back at square one. And I was just sitting on my couch thinking, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do with this now. But at the same time, I drew very particular conclusions that were, I need to get myself like pronto a new chopping block. I live, uh, you know, in, uh, outside of the city, so I need to chop my own wood to heat the house. And the chopping block I had was too short and too uneven. And given how everything is interconnected, the back pain that I was developing, chopping wood on that uh, shitty chopping block mm. that affected everything that like my back is with me at all times whether i'm asleep or awake 
and I need to take care of that. So I quickly got myself a new chopping block. I got myself a new mattress because I had a shitty mattress. And there, there were these like very down to earth, concrete, particular conclusions mm -hmm. that came out of that trip without me like thinking that through very yeah. much. It was just a realization. I don't know what the world is, but I do know I need to get myself a new mattress. Well, I mean, this is an interesting feature. It seems to be the way uh, these experiences can impart conviction, right? And, and this is, you know, again, it can go in so many different directions. People can develop convictions about weird things. They can have some Absolutely. weird idea and decide that's really true. And they can, you know, they can go crazy. I, I mean, right. you know, the, uh, another, you know, uh, conviction uh, is a variable. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a knob, it's, it's a tuning, and you, it can be applied to things of a, of, of a great variety. And I think psychedelics can, 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 uh, can illustrate that. And, and there's a, a related feature, which is that just the way the world can seem charged with meaning. Like I remember once back, uh, Decades and decades ago, I'm out uh, playing, uh, I guess we were uh, either, we were kind of kicking a soccer ball and we had we had uh, taken several friends of mine and I had taken uh, some LSD and we were, uh, you know, we, 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 we looked around, it was getting cloudy, it looked like it might rain. We thought, well, we should head back to the apartment and we're, and we're going. And then suddenly there's this thunder. Now, you know, whenever you hear thunder, you think, okay, that reinforces my sense that I should maybe go home. But this was like, no, this was a message from the universe directed at us, right? You know, it's like, whoa, yeah, whoa. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's just like it had, thunder had a kind of meaning. Right. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't ordinarily have. And, and uh, again, I'm, uh, I don't think, you know, I, I don't know what exactly it's, it's interesting to me. I mean, sometimes I thought like, you know, when, 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 uh, when anthropologists of religion talk about animism as an early stage in the development of religious thought, I thought <clears throat> now I know what they mean, right? It's like, yeah, the universe is charged with meaning. It's alive. And, uh, but I don't know. It's just an interesting feature. Nik Nikita, I have one more question for you about DMT, but John, did you want to react to all this? Well, ask, you know, this, I, I think one of the questions we're circ circling around here is, is what do we make of the, I don't know, insights or whatever you want to call them that we take away from, uh, from these experiences or that occur to us as we're living our lives, the, um, the, the way I look at any kind of truth now, whether it comes from science or philosophy, uh, theology, is uh, is as a kind of like, like a poem, a, uh, a a piece of fiction. Um, I think even our most our most powerful theories, even the uh, theory of ev evolution by natural selection, quantum mechanics, we should see them as these stories that we invent to help make sense of. Um, of the world, and they they work in different ways. You know, some of the theories obviously give us the power to manipulate the physical world um, and produce really extraordinary consequences. Quantum mechanics being a, a prime example of that. But we should always see them as um, incomplete, as provisional, uh, as tentative, replaceable by new stories. I'm an extreme skeptic, but I need stories. I need stories to help me make sense of my life. Um, so I use them all the time, but I try to only have a tentative relationship with them. And we're ready to jettison them when they cease becoming useful to me. And I'm always on the lookout for new ones, if only just because they make the world a little more delightful um, in the same way that a great movie or, or piece of literature does. Yeah. Um, so Nikita, what I was going to ask you, I, I, is to uh, go back and talk about uh, again your your early uh, maybe your early DMT kind of visitations and and not so much talk about like what you're currently making of their meaning, but uh -huh. just what it was like 
because it sounded to me like it was dramatically different from a lot of psychedelic experiences. Just what it was like when this thing that uh, was more fleshed out, it sounds like, than John's shards of glass, maybe more interested, more specifically interested in communication with you. I don't know. But like, just what what was that like? Okay, so again, a disclaimer is this is putting words on something that is very hard to put words on. Um, I'll try to speak, depending on how much time we have, I'll, I'll try to give either one or two examples. So the first two DMT experiences I had, they were consecutive. One day and then the next day I smoked again. Um, and the first one was way too much for me to process. The first entity I saw was this uh, happy creature that seemed like a mixture between a uh, jester and some kind of multidimensional space person uh, that was dancing around and it was very excited to see me and it was like, all right, yeah, do it. And and he was showing did it me have something. Head and, did it have like a head and arms or was it more abstract? Than that? that one was, yeah, like a humanoid. Okay. Uh, the rest... Well, I'll get to that if if, if we have time. Um, and his main thing is was to invite me and to encourage me to pay attention to this process that it, he was pointing to, this like visual flow of things that seemed to be imbued with meaning. I didn't get a lot of that first trip because I was on the edge. I was trying to pay attention to what is being shown to me and trying to understand it. And... At times, I felt like I'm getting there, like there's progress being made. I'm starting to understand what is going on and and why this entity is so excited to show it to me. But then it felt like making progress along this line was, I was using myself, my own consciousness, my, my essence, and converting it into this understanding. And it was... Like for me to fully understand what is being shown to me, uh, I had to, like, until I get it, I'm not sure what is going on. And by the time I get it, it's done. And I might have traded, you know, myself, my uh, understanding of the world, my essence, my soul, whatever, uh, for this other thing. And I don't have enough information to, decide whether the trade is worth it, whether I'm being tricked or not. Um, and so I was, throughout the trip, I was like oscillating on this uh, But you mean you're feeling. afraid that the bargain, that you don't want the deal? Like, like yeah, understanding, I didn't have enough- this thing is saying, don't you get it? There's this thing I want you to understand. And you're thinking you're reluctant to achieve understanding because of the sacrifices it might entail in some sense? Right, because understanding, the process of understanding is also the process of changing who I am. Like it is, I need to change who I am in order to get this thing. And I don't know if I want to, like, maybe I, this is going to change me into something I don't want to be. Hmm. And so throughout the trip, I was like, not sure. I was getting there, and then I was not sure. And when I was not sure, it just flooded me, me with, a sense of calm down. Here's why you don't need to worry. It's all love, and there's just like it's all great. And it was convincing. I'm like, okay, all right, I'll I'll take another shot at this, and then back. And so then the next day, I smoked some more, and it almost felt like these other entities that I saw in the second trip were aware of what happened on the first one, and they had a different approach to it. They're, they were calm. They were not pushing They're me like, to understand They're like, okay, that anything. didn't work. Let's try this. <laughs> it, it seemed like, yeah, this was a very, like, very excited, you know, go get this thing. And it didn't work. And so the next time it's like, maybe like this jester character is not the one who's going to be able to explain it to me because he's too frantic. And uh, the next time it was like multiple entities and they were like, all right, calmly hear what we have to show. Mm. And it was this uh, very calm, uh, very complex and difficult to process, but a very calm experience of there are these entities and uh, objects or uh, processes 
um, presented as this visual flow of information were presented, were like flowing from them. And I would pay attention to that and they would allow me to turn it different ways and look at it from different angles. That was the first time, like I've heard many times before then in like in school that in mathematics there are objects that are that have more dimensions than three and i never understood what that even means like how i could comprehend it and there i was looking at this thing and i was turning it around like oh there's the fourth dimension i didn't know that was possible <laughs> and so that was a very so you thought you were starting to see what they wanted to show you mm -hmm. and had the initial do you think i'm probably reading too much into it but had the initial reluctance on your part had any of the flavor of, wait, to know the truth, I'll have to surrender the self. I'll have to surrender my identity. Uh, yeah, that, that's one way to phrase it. Well, that's interesting. That, because, you know, what's, what's interesting yeah. about that is that, that that's, that's a really common theme in the mystical path, the right. religious path, that right. you, you, know, you got to be prepared to leave everything behind Right. If you really and abandon the self and, and seeing the truth means abandoning the self. And yeah. this is what I was talking about. I mean, this, I think this is true. Okay. I mean, that's <laughs> my, my point is that like on a meditation retreat, I can see how the self, this, this thing that evolution has given us, this like desperate, controlling, judgmental device mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is like not a good lens through which to see the world if you really want to see the world, okay? Right. And I think that's true. And, and I think there are arguments you can make on, on behalf of that proposition. You know, th this also, one of the, you guys know, I've been trying to understand, to learn quantum mechanics over the last uh, 18 months or so. And one of the, the obsessions um, that, uh, that uh, I've been tormented with is that whenever we learn something, we're giving something else. That that learning is a kind of uh, brainwashing and, and a loss of our previous identity. We gain something, but we lose something. But we can see something new, but in seeing something new and pay att paying attention to that, we're not paying attention to these other things over here. Um, and a lot of physicists, I think, when they learn quantum mechanics, they take it for granted. They can manipulate the equations. They can perform computations, but they become, it kind of blinds them to the strangeness of the world that's actually revealed by, by uh, quantum mechanics. So it seems to me the trick of learning and, and acquiring knowledge is to get it without sacrificing something without giving up some kind of vision in exchange for this new insight. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, I so, missed what you were saying due to connectivity issues, but I think I, I understand I, what you're saying. Yeah. I, I think we make choices about what we pay attention to, uh, and right. that, um, keeps us from, from seeing things. And, and I agree, John, I've been frustrated by how many uh, quantum physicists seem not interested in the philosophical questions raised by quantum physics. Um, the, uh, I, I want to um, see one, one thing that's, well, first, Nikita, I have to ask to just finish this line. Uh, and I know we should, we should wrap it up soon and uh, leave more for maybe a future conversation. But the, um, have you achieved a clearer idea since then of what they wanted to show you? I mean, the fourth dimension, sound, I'd like to be able to more clearly conceptualize the fourth dimension. I think I know what it is. It's time, according to one view, but I, I never have been able to visualize uh, four dimensions. Um, is there, I mean, first of all, is that kind of the, the, the first thing you were, you thought you were shown? And secondly, has, have you developed a clear idea of like what it is you're supposed to see? I don't think I, I have developed some ideas and ways to formulate it, but I don't think it can be put in words. And uh, it, it back to this question about the unitive aspect of these experiences. I think it's like it's what they were trying to show me is that everything 
is this one process, uh, the syncretic moving of stuff. And then it's just pay attention to how it works. And when you pay attention, you start finding these connections, different patterns, how to apply yourself to it, how your mindset affects everything that you perceive, the relationship. Like, it's not, you're not going to be able to put it in words. Like, the thing is, mind works this way and reality works that way. Uh, but you're shown the thing in action and uh, you're invited to pay attention. And uh, then you are able, hopefully, to get something practical out of it. But it's this like, here, everything is right here happening. Pay attention to how it works. Okay. If, if we have time, I want to show uh, to share one more DMT experiences sure. with, with these entities. And it's a continuation on the theme, I suppose. Um, there is, so th this was the trip when I found out that the body is still there. And not only it's still there, but it's affecting everything, the contents of the trip. And it was, um, so I was dealing with these entities, different kinds. They were very cold, very sort of like mental, like uh, cognitive, uh, cerebral. And they were urging me to understand what is going on. Again, there's this like, here's things are happening. And on their part, it was less like the, the what I was just describing, that was this like, a gentle showing me of how things work and yeah, pay attention, try to figure it out. Here it was like, you gotta pay attention and you gotta figure it out. We need it. Uh, you, you, you shouldn't be just uh, uh, standing by as reality is trying to figure itself out. We need your participation to sort this out. And it's a big challenge. And they were like pushy. And I was trying to understand what they're what they're showing me, and I was failing. I was like a little bit, sort of like getting making some progress, and I'm like, yeah, no, I don't understand anything here. And they were like, well, you have to pay it, like a you know, like a strict teacher. You got to work on this problem. Um, and so there was some period of time of me trying to sort this out and deal with these guys. And then at one point, a few things happened simultaneously. One, I just felt like. I don't trust these ones. I don't, I don't know if I need to be uh, listening to their directions. There's something lacking here. They're showing me the thing that is supposed to be everything. And I feel like there's something, uh, something that's not here. Uh, and I also turned my head in the physical reality. And at the time, I didn't remember I had a head. And... Uh, I found out that I was making some noises and the pitch of those noises changed. And the attention within the body, again, I didn't, wasn't aware that there was a body, but I realized that it's moving from somewhere up uh, in, in the upper body, it was moving lower. And as those things happened, the entire thing changed. The entire experience completely changed. I was, again, in a place that was like, this is, everything and there was an entity there and it felt like now i'm interacting with just like before i felt i'm interacting with reality at the most fundamental level now i had the same feeling but it's just the reality was completely switched from one to another and that other one was fiery warm colors there's a female uh sort of goddess or demon or something dancing in these fires uh, very seductively and it was very it was a much better place very nice felt very good the lady was attractive and I felt you know warm and comfortable and it was all great and I s spent some time there uh, and then I wouldn't. felt <laughs> but then I felt you know what something's like in here too like it's all great but what about the like the meaning of it all and the, that cerebral part there is like it's, you know, like, I don't know, laying uh, in bed with your girlfriend, you, you do it for 20 days on a good vacation. And then you're like, well, maybe we should do something or maybe you should read a book or, or something. <laughs> so there was uh, a, a feeling of there's something that's like in there. 
And then since I've by now figured out that there is this correlation between the movements in the body and the noises and whatnot and the attention within the body, I learned that you can navigate this uh, space. And so I moved back to the previous place Met the other guys again, spent some time with them, like and decided, no, this is not it. Moved back to the to the comfortable place, very pleasurable, but something's like in there. Then moved back, like moved to the middle of these two worlds and stood there for a while. Like I'm not convinced completely by either one of these places. So I'm gonna be, you know, uh mm-hmm. removed, uh equally removed from them and paused. And felt like a complete fool because I was shown like, here's one way of existing. Here's another way of existing. And then I stood there in the middle. I'm like, I'm not going to exist at all, I suppose, because neither of these compel me. And you can't do that. Existing keeps happening. Consciousness keeps experiencing things. And so that trip ended with me like going from one place to another, trying to figure out where it is that I should be or I want to be. And then the experience slowly faded away and I was left uh, there sitting in this bed thinking, I guess I've learned something about how the experience works. Next time I smoke DMT, I'm going to go into it knowing and ready to navigate more and discover more and uh, move from one place to another and see experimenting. Sounds like you may be moving dangerously toward John's view of the world, but the, the, uh, but, um, uh, you know, I mean, in terms of who's to say kind of, but, uh, uh, so we should, we should wrap this up. I want to give you each a chance to say, you know, for any, uh, kind of, kind of capsule final, uh, thought on the whole thing. Uh, I, I want to throw in one more, um, report an ayahuasca experience that somebody I know had, which is just interesting, uh, because it has some things in common with uh, yours, Nikita, in the sense that there was a, a being. In this case, it was somebody who, I think he did several of these experiences, you know, in a, in a controlled setting with a, a, you know, an expert, a guide, and 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 uh, and I think other people uh, probably present, but um, who were doing it. But um, he had had uh, asthma ever mm. since an early uh, a, a traumatic experience that involved the death of someone. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it had been one of those things where he felt some culpability, even though he shouldn't have, it was like, yeah, okay. It's true. If you hadn't suggested the guy, you go jogging, you know, he wouldn't have had the heart attack, you know, but obviously, you know, you didn't know he was going to, you know, it was that kind of thing. And, and the asthma started happening immediately after the tragedy. And the uh, and it had a kind of logical connection in various ways to the tragedy. And as I recall the report, it was like this being uh, who I think was female uh, came to him and said, uh, you know, you know what you have to do. And he was like, forgive myself. And she was like, yes. And this this is a very credible person. That was the end of the asthma. And the asthma had persisted for decades. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and so that's just, uh, you know, your mileage may vary. People have all kinds of different experiences. Some work out, some don't. Uh, they can be good, they can be bad. But, but that has certain things in common. It, 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 I mean, what they have in common, Nikita, is like, I've got a message for you. And you mm-hmm. need to figure it out, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's interesting. And, and John, there was maybe a little of that with your shards of glass, right? I don't know, but but or they just wanted to screw with your head. Uh, like we don't want you to figure it out. We want you to torment you until you finally admit that there's no figuring anything out, which is what happened. Uh, so anyway, uh, let me just give you each a minute to, uh, you know, maybe maybe uh, maybe we can continue this down the road. But we've covered a lot of territory. Uh, uh, who wants to go first? I guess I'll go first. Um, I think maybe next time we could talk about, um, more about Nikita's psychedelic sex goddess. Uh, the, <laughs> the intersection of psychedelics and sex is really interesting to me. I mean, I, I don't know how much we can talk about it, 
um, in public, <laughs> but it um, it's fascinating to me. So I, you know, the intersection of everything with sex is fascinating to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I'm a person of broader interest than you. <laughs> so uh, my takeaway, you know, I'll just reiterate what you said earlier, Bob. Psychedelics are not to be taken lightly. Um, I think you know you're listening, especially to Nikita. These experiences can take you in some really bizarre places that you might have a hard time integrating with your with your regular life. You come out of it and it's like, what the fuck? And then you become estranged from everyday reality. I've had that happen to me as well. Um, the way that psychedelics should work, the way that I want them to work is like seeing a fantastic movie or going into a museum and you see these beautiful works of art and um, then you carry that feeling of in the beauty you've seen and, and this order that the, the artists have put before you, you take that into the world and you see the world in this new way, you're transformed. And it does break through your tendency to take things for granted. Um, psychedelics have done that for me. I, I feel like it's pushed me permanently in uh, that direction. But one thing is clear from our discussion here is that they do really different things for different people. Mm -hmm. uh, so some anyway. commonalities, some baseline commonalities, but they can take you into very different spaces. Yeah. Uh, including some places that are, that are, can be very painful and, and yep. confusing. Yep. What I want to say I'm not sure what I want to say in, in conclusion. I, I keep thinking about, um, so the last time I smoked DMT was this Changa thing. And I didn't mean, didn't, didn't want to uh, have the full experience. I just decided I'm going to take a tiny little toke, which I did. And then it just reminded me about what the experience is, uh, which was DMT. It's very hard to remember to to keep it in your mind of what it what it like I've, I've told all these stories now but it's all it's a shadow of a shadow of a shadow and i was just reminded of what it is and then i thought well now to not do the full thing is just cowardice it's just to because because the feeling i have from dmt is it it's almost like everyday life is we're uh, these whores, uh, horses with, what do you call them? Those blinders. Blind, blinders. Blinders. And you just have a little bit in front of you what you can focus on, and focusing on it is, is difficult. Uh, and you just go around your life, and then DNT throws the reality at you, and you're confronted with what actually is going on, or like how much more is going on. And then it's hard to ignore it. It's like the, you know, the pill from the matrix. Now you know what the situation is. Um, it's, it's hard to then just go, you know what? I'll, I'll go back to my, I have a deadline and uh, I need to do a thing and there's cleaning that needs to be done around the house. And so that made me, I was completely sober, like the, the, that small talk you know, the experience lasted for a couple of minutes. Then I was completely sober and I thought, I got to do the thing now because if I don't, this is just turning away from the uh, urgency and the, the complexity of the situation. And You mean you have to uh, do the full dose? Yeah. And then I did. And uh, it was very helpful and illuminating, though very little can be said about it. <laughs> well... You know, uh, William James described the classic mystical experience as noetic, but ineffable, meaning it imparts knowledge, but you can't, the knowledge right. is very hard to describe. Right. So you're, you're, you're uh, complying with his requirements. Okay. <laughs> so uh, thank you guys. This has been really interesting and maybe we thank will, uh, we'll see, we'll see uh, what reaction we get and see if we have failed to answer all questions about this subject. And if so, maybe we can reconvene, but, uh, but. Uh, thanks so much. Go ahead and uh, quickly say anything about anything you want to promote. Twitter handle, whatever. John Horgan is at Horganism. 
Yeah, I'm uh, continuing to write about <clears throat> about um, my confusion over quantum mechanics on my uh, in, in Scientific American. So if people want to see what my latest thoughts are, they can just check that out. Okay. My home is Psychopolitica, spelled with a C, dot com or psychopolitica.substack.com. Okay. I am Robert Ryder on Twitter and the non-zero newsletter in uh, in Substack World. So thanks. Thanks, you guys. This has been great. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, John. So long, you guys.